Have you ever felt discombobulated? <laughs> well, it's that time of the year. Just discombobulated. It's not quite fall, and it's not quite summer. It's kind of in between. You know, cold enough to remind you that fall is here, and warm enough to remind you that summer hasn't left. And somewhere in between, we know that fall is really in the air. So you kind of feel all of that conflux of varieties of the season changing, because at times they are a changing. And I don't know if you've noticed that, but likewise, spiritually, in the world, things are changing. They're not quite what they seem to be. You know, it's been three years now that everyone has been saying that Israel is going to bomb Iran. And it hasn't happened. <laughs> oh, that's like a rumor of war. And you know how rumors are. Oh, they're going to do it. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense for Israel to bomb Iran, you know. Sure, and start a war. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I believe that. You see, there's lots of things that people get wrapped up on and excited about that probably don't amount to a whole lot of a hill of beans that really isn't that important when it comes to eternity. One of the things that I find interesting is that people get wrapped up on elections. You know, they get all excited about, oh, well, you know, the end of the, the end of America has come because, you know, the opposing party got in charge. And then they change it and go back to some other party and deal with that for a while. And then they go, oh, that's bad, so we need to change that. And they're constantly, you know, back and forth, you know, up and down, sideways. Well... One thing is sure, and one thing that I really rejoice in, is that I can always turn to the Word of God when I'm discombobulated. When I'm discomfited, you know, when it doesn't seem to make much sense, when I look at man and his ways, then I can always look at God and the way He is. Because I have a more sure word of prophecy. I have a more confident expectation of my day than the way men deal with life in general. And I don't need to fret and worry and care about all these other things that are in the world. I have enough to be concerned about just with me and God alone, talking one to one. Whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. The children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. You know, I hear a lot about the promises of God, the promises of God. People even go out of their way to buy these books called The Promises of God, and they sit down and they do the one of these like, uh, this is a promise of God, God, I want to remind you this, this, this says that you're going to give me a wonderful life, you know, and I get it, you know, this is mine, I'm owning it, I'm possessing it, I'm, I'm claiming it as my own. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way, folks. Come on, get a grip. If God gives you and fulfills that promise, God help you. <laughs> because he's no debtor to any man. So, on the one hand, he might kind of like, you know, just shut you up by giving you what you really want. Or, if you admit it, his will be done instead of your own, then you may want to wait until God brings that promise to you as opposed to going out of your way to take it out of context and name it, claim it in the name of Jesus because, yeah, I'll you know, be honest with you for a minute. You, know, you, could, you could claim that God's going to prosper you and God might prosper you, but God knows that you'll probably choke on it before you get done with it because guess what? There were lepers that were like uh, in this one city in the Old Testament, you know, and the prophet had come to the king and said and prophesied that, you know, you'll see the deliverance of, of uh, Israel, but you won't believe it. You know, you'll die from it, you know, and 
it was kind of a long story, but to make the long story short, basically the problem was was that the king's heart wasn't right before God. And so, on the one hand, God was going to deliver the children of Israel, but the king wasn't going to really participate in it. He would see the deliverance, but he wouldn't be alive to enjoy it. And so what happened was that, you know, the God sent angels to scare off those that had surrounded, you know, the the Jerusalem and Jerusalem was delivered and sure enough, you know, when uh, the king got ready to, you know, go out to see the deliverance, you know, the people stampeded and trampled him to death because they had heard that, you know, the army that had surrounded them was gone and they had been starving so bad that they were even eating their own children. Pretty disgusting. But like the prophet had said, you'll see it, but you won't eat it or something like that. Pretty similar to that. But the point being is that God might give you something no offense, that you petitioned him for, that you have begged him for, that you have said, God, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. You know, kind of like Jesus said, you know, the unrighteous judge, you know, even though, you know, the woman petitions night and day, you know, that he would even give it to her because, you know, she just, in order to quit bugging him, you know, she just gave it to her. Well, once in a while, there's something true about God. When you really ask for something and you bug him enough, and it's according to his word, well, you know, he might give it to you as a learning experience, but once you got it, you may get it that you didn't want it in the first place. Because really what we want from God is what he wants for us. What we should expect from God is what he wants to give us according to his will and not our own. So don't get caught up in this prosperity, guys, you know, that... They, they take something out of scripture, you know, and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, as God promises, he has to fulfill his word. Notice the will of who is being said and done there. He has to fulfill it because I'm making God do what he doesn't want to do. He wants to walk with you and talk with you. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to cause you at the right timing in the right place to enjoy his will for your life because when God directs God anoints and appoints for you a blessing to be used for other people's lives and not your own only you see most of the people that grab these promises and you know oh God's gonna give it to me I got it I'm writing my name on it usually are using it for themselves only and they have no interest in anybody else but selfishness. That's not the way God operates. That's not the way God wants you to be. Don't get caught up in these promises without there being God's timing and perfect circumstance put together to accomplish His will and not your will to be done. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It is better to put trust in the Lord than to put confidence in elected officials. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in democratic parties. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in Republican parties. As a matter of fact, it's better to put confidence in the Lord than to put confidence in the Constitution of America. Do you get the picture? You put your confidence in man, you'll be disappointed. You put your confidence in the Lord, you'll never be disappointed. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fail, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Notice it says, though he fail. The footsteps of, an or of a man are ordered of the Lord. In other words, if you look at that scripture and read it and think about it, the footsteps of a man are ordered of the Lord, and though he fail. If God's ordering his footsteps, can God order someone's footsteps to fail? <gasps> Blasphemy! Well, for some it is, but you see, Failure doing God's will is not failure in His sight. It might be in yours. It might be in the world's, and it might be in some expectation you have of the accomplishing of what you thought God wanted. But what if God's will was for you to fail? 
Who? Does God ever do that? Does God ever want a man to not succeed in something that he has stepped out to do? Does God ever want to take us through failure in order to discover success? In my own life, I'd say, Amen. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> I've had a few Ishmaels, you know, in my life, you know, where God took me through failure in order to accomplish success. You see, it isn't always about abundant life and you think that you're going to get success and riches and glory and honor and praise. No. You see, Jesus was a failure. No, really, he was. I mean, as far as the world was concerned, you look at him and you say, well, he had great teachings, and then he'd go and say something and people would quit following him. He had great ideas, then he'd say something and people would quit following him. Then at the end of his life, he was only around for three and a half years in his ministry, and all of a sudden, at the height of his ministry, bam, they crucify him. Oh, it's over. Success or failure? Well, at the moment of the crucifixion, failure. But in the long term, as we see it from God's perspective, his failure was God's success. Because God used that life, though terminated early, in perfect timing, to be ended according to his will and not Jesus' own. So that way, the Father not only would be able to accomplish through us the salvation of the world and the proclamation of the gospel to the entire universe, much less just you know, people, but also to angels, as well as those things we can't see, but that God could take his life story and make it complete success for what the long-term effect would be as opposed to the short-term results. So you see, a lot of people will take short-term. They want now. They want God to meet them now. They want God to fix it now. They want God to deliver them now. So they won't look for what God wants to do. They'll look for what they want from God. Our calling and our election is to look to God, to ask God, to work with God, to be with God, Emmanuel, God in us, to the accomplishment of His will and not our own. God wants us to be His children. God wants us to be obedient to him in what he says to do and leave the results up to him. Who can make straight that which God has made crooked? And who can make crooked <laughs> that which God has made straight? Nobody but God. For you see, God is at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure. So what you think about God's will has absolutely nothing to do with God himself. It's what your understanding is at the time that your reasoning had such limited information to comprehend what little bit you could. But God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And as he says it, he has full expectation that you realize because he's bigger than you are, because he's smarter than you are, because he's wiser than you are. The only thing left for you to do is to, quite frankly, trust him.